So I was asked a question, how do we document what our automated tests do and cover without adding a lot of overhead? And how do we know what is not covered by automation? So I'm going to try and show some tips towards doing that in this video. So my name is Alan Richardson. You can find me at eviltester.com. And we're going to look at uh, essentially modeling. I mean, I've written about modeling for a long time. The first blog posts I ever wrote were um, all about modeling. This is back in 2002, and I suspect I wrote this beforehand. All coverage assessments are comparing some sort of model to some sort of thing to see how they map. And the more they map, the more coverage we have. Now, this blog post scares people because it's got test scripting in it. And people think, oh, test scripting, he wants us to write scripts. When we do automated execution, when we write code to automate applications, we're essentially writing test scripts. When we write a JUnit method and it has at test on the top, that's pretty much a test script. I'm saying, do this, do this, do this, do this, check this, check this. That's what a test script is. But back in the day, when I was looking at test scripting, test scripts essentially were based on models. I want to do a flow. I want to go from here into here, across to here, back to here, do these things. So I could generate the test scripts. Now there's a concept called model-based testing that we're not really covering here, where you can derive paths through a model and it will automatically execute. But all coverage is based on a model. When we look at code to attempt to go, what does this code cover? I have a mental model of what that code could be doing. And when I look at the code, I then map the code back on my mental model to then go, right, what is it actually doing? What is it covering? What is it not? We always have this. We always have models. And um, it can be hard to analyze an entire set of tests. If I try to analyze all the tests in here, even though there's not that many, I need a pretty big mental model. So when we're looking at code, we tend to work in very small chunks to keep our models um, very tight. When we want to try and analyze system coverage, then we move over to the left-hand side and then we start looking at test names, um, method names, class names, packages to get a feel for the coverage. Because looking at this, I can see that I have some abstractions. Abstractions are useful because they hide implementation and make test code easier to read and understand. So here's an example, here's an abstraction. I've got a navigation menu on my pulp bar and I'm gonna set it to be a particular version. I can understand what that means. And um, there's aspects here that are not well abstracted. So if you don't know uh, that there's a kind of secret flag in the pulp bar to set the version, then this won't make much sense. But an abstraction could make that clear. If I had an abstraction that said, go to the pulp bar for a specific version, put the version in, then it's clear what's happening in the steps. So abstractions are really useful for helping us read code clearly and simply to understand what it's doing, to map it against the model in our head. So other things that can help us are uh, test names. If this test name is readable and understandable, then I can look at it and go, right, what is this test doing? Now I've been experimenting with JUnit 5 and parameterized tests to try and make that even more simple. So rather than having to rely on this test name, which doesn't have spaces in it because we're trying to make syntactically correct code, I've got a display name that will be displayed. Then this test will run multiple times with the parameter that I'm passing it. So I'm making parameter based test and you can see the output when they're executed here, this is very readable. So looking at the output of the test execution, because I have good names or because I'm making them readable through annotations, it's a lot easier for me to review the output to understand the coverage based on a mental model that I have of this system. When we are working on agile projects, we might have stories and the stories are a small discrete chunk of functionality or value that we're working on. So I can review the code check-ins that we've created for that particular story, because hopefully they're, uh, they've are they got the story ID and I can search through the version control system and see what code we wrote to match that story. I can review the code and the test for that against that story. What I've got is a model, which is a story, and I compare the acceptance criteria there into the code that we've written. 
And the story helps keep the review small enough that I can hold it in my head. When we have models that go beyond that, then we need to do a little bit more. We can't hold all that stuff in our head. Other things that are useful is making the data visible. The data that's important for the test should be visible. The data that's unimportant, I don't want to see in the test because it's just going to distract me. So here the data is coming in from a method. If I look up here, I can see it's uh, an integer stream going from one to the maximum version. This is an abstraction, so it updates all the time. But if I click in there, I can see it's 11. So I know that this is going to run from one to 11 and the output tells me that this data is visible because it's the important data for the test. If I was um, creating forms or typing things in and it was unimportant to the test, I would want that data to be hidden in an abstraction there so I don't see it and don't get distracted. So if this said something, if I was creating a book, I didn't care what data was in, rather than having something that says create book, then the title, then the author's name, then something else, I would just want create a book and then the book comes back. So I want abstractions that make it clear what's happening so that I can review and assess coverage, but don't distract me with um, irrelevant information for that particular test. So the structure of the code is also very important to support our review process. So I've only just started working on this project. There's not a lot of tests in here, but looking at the structure of the code, I can see it's all related to a particular application, the pulper. Um, and I can see that I have abstractions in here. This will eventually move into the main section so that it doesn't distract me when I'm reviewing the test code. And you can see that I have um, tests for all the versions. So for all the versions, I'm using the navigation menu. You can see that I don't have anything for version one, two or three specifically. So I know there's a lack of coverage there for those versions. I have nothing at all for versions four through 11. So I know I have gaps. I can see that in the versioning, I'm checking if I can change the version and then the methods tell me how I am changing the version with the admin menu, with a direct URL via the admin page. The naming is helping me assess the coverage. Now, if I ran the test, I would have the output down here and this would be even easier for me to read. I've got multiple places to review this in terms of coverage. So this isn't an automated coverage process. This is a manual review coverage process. So the hard part is more, what are we not covering? So here it's obvious to me that I'm not covering these things because I have gaps which are obvious from the package. So if I can make the model clear and obvious, then I can see that there are gaps. But I don't want to have uh, models in here that are hard to maintain. I don't want to really have lots of annotations in here. Like, I'm just going to make this up. Uh, story, oops, story, and then if that was the number of the story, because then I have to keep maintaining this. This doesn't automatically update. I'd have to click through and review this story to make sure this test applies. When I'm working on a story by story basis, I would rather review it at the point that we're creating the code and look at the um, code check-ins to review it rather than rely on an annotation, because this is essentially a comment and it can go out of date. So things I've done in the past is when I'm testing APIs or websites, I've run the test and put it through a proxy, then captured all the traffic in a HAR file, which is an XML format file, then analyze that file to compare against a model of the application. So if I have a sitemap, say for a website, I could compare all the URLs and make sure I hit them in the HAR file. And that gives me some assessment of, have I done enough coverage to check against the sitemap? If I had an API, in the past I've built models of the API, so I know all the endpoints, I know all the verbs, and then I'll look through all the um, traffic and go, did I hit this endpoint with all the verbs? If I haven't, then I know I have gaps in my coverage. You can write relatively simple things that help you find gaps in your coverage, but you're still making a model, and sometimes this has to be very custom. So what a lot of people do is they use tooling to help them. One tool that people use is uh, Cucumber. So any of the BDD style tools, because what these let you do, and I'm just using their website as an example here. I don't have any examples in my code. You can see here that we have a feature, we have a scenario, and this is a, written in English. So it's written at a high level domain specific language, which makes it easy to read. 
The other thing it lets you do is um, you can have data parameterization. So here is an example of Gherkin using a data table. Now, I assume when I'm seeing this, that the data that's exposed in this table is important, right? Because this is what I'm reviewing in terms of coverage. I assume that if the name was unimportant, we would have something in the abstraction that creates a user um, with any name and we don't care about it. What's important is that there's a user with these email addresses or these Twitter handles. Uh, when I want to use Gherkin to illustrate coverage, I only want to expose the information that is important. Anything that's not important will distract me in a review, will distract me when I'm doing maintenance, will make me think I've got potentially more coverage than I might have. The Gherkin, when we're modeling coverage there, should be very specific. Now, I like the uh, use of parameterized data tests in JUnit. Um, the output is very readable um, and I don't have to bring in another tool, but I can still achieve a lot of the same aims, which are making um, readable code, making the data that we're using visible, making the high level conditions that we're um, checking and asserting for visible in the output. People tend to go overboard when they start using tools like Gherkin and do everything in Gherkin. Use Gherkin to support you when you're modeling um, automated execution code. When you need something that is to be reviewed by people that either don't know how to code or won't learn how to code, or people who are gonna review it without anyone that knows how to code being with them. Now you can see here, it's very easy for someone who doesn't know how to code to review the coverage here because we're outputting it in English language. Someone could review that. I could train people to review the um, test code here. And if I really wanted someone who didn't know how to code to review this, I would rely on more abstractions in here to make my code more readable. Abstractions can help you move away from having to use tools like this for automated execution. And then you don't run the risk of being shouted at because you start saying we're doing BDD. When you're not doing BDD, it's perfectly valid to use Gherkin uh, in combination with Cucumber to support you for making some of your coverage visible through a domain specific language. Just don't use it for everything and certainly don't think that you're doing BDD when you do this. So that's a high level overview of what we're doing. Because remember what we've got is we've got trying to use code that is packaged in such a way that makes it easy to review, that exposes gaps so we can see where the coverage is, that outputs in a form that is easy for us to review and understand, that when we want to work at a lower level in terms of looking at the story acceptance criteria or the acceptance criteria in a test, the test itself is very readable. So we'd improve this to support that type of coverage review. We can extend our automated execution to run through proxies or to log more information and capture that and then process it after the fact to compare it to custom models that we create. That can give us some assessments outside the code here and help us look for gaps. But that takes a little bit more work. Or we can use tools like um, Gherkin to model aspects of our execution, but not everything, just to make certain parts visible. But modeling is the key thing we're doing here. Now modeling doesn't mean it has to be a diagram because a graph, the underlying mathematical model from this is not a diagram. This is a diagrammatic form of the model. So we create models that we can compare with something else and all coverage is based around models. And if you're reviewing the code to assess coverage, you're using a mental model or you may have stuff written down that you're comparing with it. So someone's mental model has been put on paper. The more that we can automate the um, coverage, the better off we are because we won't let things slip through and we won't make as many mistakes. This data is visible, 